welcome to our knowledge hub session with Ivan Len, postdoc at Helmholtz Center, Munich. I'm Ramakrishnan, NGSF member and PhD student at Helmholtz Center, Munich, and will be hosting today's session. Before we start our session, I would like to briefly introduce what we do at NextGen Scientist Foundation and why we are hosting events such as this one. NGSF is a non-profit organization started by Indian researchers to promote science and to create scientific awareness among the general public. We started by introducing an internship program which supports students based in a research lab across India up to three months during summer by traveling and competition costs. We have put up the Next Gen Science Communicator essay competition which identifies and rewards students with interest and skill in science communication. Selected students from the company because of lockdown. This motivated us to build a social network that can compensate for this loss of time, which we would like to call as the Indian Life Science Network, our Discord server. Through the server, we would like to connect researchers in India with researchers abroad to share ideas, experiences, opportunities, and paper access to effectively cut down research time in the future. Next goal of this platform is to connect this pool of Indian researchers with present-day students in India who aspire research careers for better career guidance and mentorship. Lastly, we would like to connect researchers with science communicators to help them fish out interesting research directly from the authors. Several parts of this server have been carefully thought out to drive meaningful interactions between researchers, aspiring researchers, and science communicators. While you are at the server, explore the set of channels that you see on the left. Start by choosing the user role in the user roles channel, such as researcher, aspiring researcher, and science communicator. Meet people in your subject area and cities by reacting to roles in relevant channels. Lastly, to effectively media mediate the interaction between these three groups, we have started organizing online events. One such concept is Knowledge Hub which takes advantage of the Discord stage. Through Knowledge Hub, we would like to simulate a real-life small room discussion with a panel of speakers or a guest. This brings us to today's event with Chung Wen Lin. Chung Wen Lin is a Taiwanese national and our first international guest speaker at the Indian Life Science Network. He has done his PhD from National Cheng Kung University, Taiwan. Chung Wen has also worked so far in Academia Sinica Taiwan, National Institute for Basic Biology Japan, and finally now as a postdoc at Institute for Network Biology, where, where I happen to do my PhD as well. Chingwen Lin, after starting off as a conventional plant biologist working with tissue culture and plant phenotyping experiments, has completely transitioned into a bioinformatician. During this session, we are going to explore this career transition and check if we can do that as well. All right, Chingwen, we are extremely excited to have you here with us. How are you doing? How are you feeling to be here? And where are you joining us from? Thank you. Thank you, Rama, for the introduction. Hi, I'm Chong Wen. And uh, yeah, like um, Rama just introduced, I'm coming from Taiwan. And now I'm in Taiwan um, because some personal issue. OK. And uh, yeah, I, I'm glad I have the chance to, I would not say share, but OK, kind of share my experience with you or with you guys. Um, about what I did earlier and what I'm doing now, especially I think some of, maybe some of you are interesting from switch your direction from let's say trend, um, not transition but way lab to a dry lab experience uh, experiment. So yep. So um, yeah, that's from my side. If you want. So before we go further, let me inform you all that you can ask questions to Chung Wen at any time point. All you have to do is raise your hand and you will be moved to the stage. Once your question is answered, we will put you back with the audience. So with that said, let's begin. So Chung Wen, what are your current research interests? What are you working on right now? Um, so currently, um, as a, po a postdoc in Institute of Naval Biology, I'm working on is um, the main project is with the SARS uh, COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, um, because from the lab they we generate the protein interaction between viral proteins and the human proteins, 
and then by that we try to reveal some possible interaction or possible candidates that people can use in the future possibly to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. So I, this is one thing I'm interested in. The other thing I'm interested in is to uh, study the transcriptomic data, especially from the high throughput data analysis, or people call it sometimes call it next generation sequencing. I think this field is attracting me a lot to, to focus on it. So that's my current research institute. Uh, I'm really curious, um, although I know, but I think for a lot of the audience, they may not have heard of it. Why do we have an institute for network biology? So what is it about like network science? What is new about it? Um, I think this, this is a, the main reason I joined this group, because I think for more, yeah, maybe for, let's, let's call, let me call it traditional lab, in, in most cases, the, in a lab, in a single lab, they used to focus on a few um, study targets. But I think, so when, when I, as I start from a master's student, I working on single gene or a few proteins experience. And then I start to um, join the, the field using microarray to study some gene expression. And then I feel that if every time we only focus on a few things, it's really difficult to explain the big biology question. So then um, after I, I finish my PhD, I think it's time to have a higher, higher level or higher angle um, to check the whole situation. So then it's coming to the naval biology because it's everything I think they connect to each other. So you mean to say you know, in the network science, we try to look everything from, let's say, bird's eye viewpoint, something like that. And rather than uh, uh, like a hypothesis driven where uh, in conventional labs they work only on certain proteins uh, throughout their research career, right? Yes, correct. That's what I'm going to say. All right. So uh, I, I, I also personally feel that it's cool to work on network science. But uh, I, I also know from personal interaction with you that uh, this is not something that you have been doing uh, uh, like once you started your research career. So uh, I looked up in your Google Scholar profile and that's also going to be one of the major themes of today's uh, discussion. Is uh, the first, uh, first of the paper from you is, uh, it reads zinc induces mitogen activated protein kinase, ac kinase activation mediated by a reactive oxygen species in rice roots. Do you still remember what were you working on with uh, when you first started off as a research career, especially with uh, this kind of publication? Um, yes, I think that that one is, like you say, it's my first, uh, first also paper. And that was published during my master period. And as I said, at the moment I'm focused on the wet lab experience, uh, experiment, especially in the protein kinase activity analysis. And well, at, at least I think in most cases in Taiwan, the, for the master students, they just follow the advice from the advisor. So at that moment when I joined the lab, and the major um, topics is always about the protein kinase activity. So then I follow the previous um, protocols or pipeline to do this study and then this is the output at the moment. So we do do some like a protein uh, protein induction and protein purification, and some in vitro kinase analysis, and check the activity by either by Western blood or yeah, like I said, by the in vitro kinase assay, and then we just publish this very. I th I think it's a very narrow topics, a very narrow result because it's just a few. A few things are really explained in the paper. Okay. All right. So it's worlds apart from what you're doing right now. So I wanted to, let's say, um, I wanted you to take us through this career trajectory that you have taken uh, right now through your Google Scholar. And uh, so I see that slowly towards 2013 on, you've started working on transcriptome and other stuff. So. How did you, uh, when did you start working with uh, bioinformatic tools and uh, bioinformatic, uh, let's say, data analysis 
type of experiments? I think it's, it's quite difficult to set a cutoff between wet and dry lab. I think at this moment, or either 10 or decades ago, 10 years ago, um, people starting using the, for example, when you're looking for some gene sequencing and you're checking the restriction and die cutting site, all these things are doing with some online or local packages. So I think at the moment, I already starting touch the field of bio, uh, bioinformatics, but not that much. And after, before these two papers you saw from Google Scholar, I already start to um, doing some analysis with microarray data. But that one, um, I'm not, the analysis, the results, I'm not in the author list. I just in the uh, acknowledged section. So I think um, 2010, 2010, there are two papers are uh, Something I start, I really starting um, touch a lot with these bioinformatics analysis, and that one is about, yeah, using some um, commercial package, commercial software. I think it's um, from Angular. I sorry, I forget the name, but it's some commercial pa uh, software to analyze the microarray data. And, that, and that's a really, I think it's quite easy entry for people are interesting with the high throughput data analysis. Okay, so uh, ever since you started uh, with your first set of analysis with microarray and until the recent COVID uh, preprint, which we have in BioArchive, what are the set of data that you have worked so far? Um, I think this, okay, <laughs> it's a, a lot, I would say that. Previously, I was uh, working with transcriptome. Now it's not about transcription. Now it's about um, how to say. I think at this moment everything is possible. So for, uh, for COVID nineteen, is we starting from protein protein interaction network, but in the end we collect as much information as possible. For example, we collect uh, the um, from the human protein alleles. We collect a tissue um, expression profile of a gene tissue expression profile. We also um, try to collect is the disease associated protein information. And we also using some other public database about protein interaction to reveal this uh, interaction, not SARS-CoV-2, but SARS-CoV with human protein. They are already been validated and we're using that as a reference, positive reference data set to validate what we did or what we get so far. So I think now it's really, well, at least for myself, it's not easy to um, set a very clear field, say what kind of data I'm really using. I would say I use as much as possible. Oh, I okay, can so if, I have, to, if yeah. I have to summarize it for you, so you have so far worked with uh, high throughput protein protein interaction data and transcriptome data and some tissue specific transcriptomes and also uh, some uh, sequence uh, assembly pipelines. Am I right? Yes, correct. Thank you for summary. <laughs> okay, all right. Thank you. So, uh, I think many of the audience here and uh, myself including, uh, one of the main point that we wanted to talk about during this discussion is to uh, ask ourselves how can we get started by, uh, like how can we equip ourselves to start uh, analyzing this high throughput uh, data. So, how do we start? So if you have, if you want to start learning uh, tools and analyzing the high throughput data, how do we start? And how did you get started, actually? Uh, well, I think for me, uh, for me to answer how I get started is more easy because um, at especially during my, I think when I started my PhD um, in a lab, like they generate some microarray data, and also they have some next generation sequencing data. But at that moment, not, I don't think any of them has the ability to really analyze the data. So when I joined that, and before that, I already um, talked to the advisor, and he's, we agree that I can focus on that data. And personally, I'm also interested to using some um, computer tools, using computer as a tool to analyze those data. So this is my, my point to starting the analysis with the data. 
I think for you guys, if you are at this moment, if you are mainly focused on the weight lab experience, um, what you can try is you can starting from your let's say if you are starting some specific proteins, you can try to, for example, in the quantum field, people are looking, uh, yeah, people are looking is in the uh, homologous genes or homologous proteins, what they behavior in different species. And by then you can extend the field, not just focus on the thing you are working on, but um, also extend, yeah, extend the, the knowledge to different species, for example. Then you can starting to start to enrich or to, to collect what kind of information you want to know or you want to add to your current research. I think this is the, the very easy point you can try. And then you will know what you need and you can you, you will find a way to, to learn that. Okay, so a uh, lot of us are on the assumption that uh, when we think about bioinformatics, that we have to start learning or the only way we can do bioinformatics is by learning some programming la languages and if uh, if i have to take an approach uh, let's say unguided approach just by looking at internet a uh, lot of options come up uh, python uh, Perl, and uh, also r and uh, i heard some terms about sql and uh, there are a lot of uh, programming lang languages I hear about. So for biologists, what are the programming languages uh, you think are relevant to learn? And what, uh, let's say, languages you use for a specific purpose? Um, it's an interesting point. I think every language, every language, they can be the, the excellent tool to solve your question. But the main issue is when you, when you try to start in one, I think the best way is take advice from your colleagues. If any of them are familiar with something, then join them is the best, the best way. And yeah, because you, you'll find the people to discuss when you have some problems or you, you have something you don't understand, that's the easy way. But if, if no one um, around you is using this kind of tool, I think at this moment, Python is a, is a good tool a good program language because at this moment they have a very very huge and well organized communities to provide some packages or of course some advice that you can get. I think Python is quite good. Um, some people they also f um, enjoy using R to do that and that's something I'm playing around a lot these days. R is also a very excellent tool. So I think Choose, just choose um, one from these two languages is um, a good choice. Per, Perl is also good, but at this moment, it's not well support. So people are not using Perl at this moment that much. For sure, like um, Rama just mentioned, there are quite a lot of things. There are something else. For example, Julia, it's very, it's more and more popular statistical program language now. But as I say, if if none of your colleagues or none of your friends familiar with LEDs, then I don't think it's a good um, starting point to to learn those things. They, no one familiar, just um, starting from something, you can easily to reach some results. And I've also been uh, hearing about two other languages. It will be also good if you can briefly mention about uh, them. Uh, one is uh, Bash. It's okay. Something. Yeah. And also, what is SQL about? Do biologists need to be good? Okay, so I think um, Bash, some people call it program language. Some people have some debate with that, but let, let's just forget that. Because at this moment, um, if you want to analyze the, this, let's call it high throughput data, especially if you are working with a genome, genome scale, or you have uh, multiple species, it's very easy to reach the limitation of personal computer. By that, I think the most easy way to analyze this huge data, sometimes it's a gigabytes or even terabytes, you need a, a, com a cluster, a computer or a server or even a cluster that has a higher performance. By that, I think people are like using um, the remote server and the operation system at the moment is most case is coming from Linux. 
So to handle that, you need um, the ability to, to using this remote server. And many of them, they don't provide this um, interactive interface. So you need doing everything from this command line. So that is what um, Bash doing. Yes and no, because Bash, as I say, some people say it's programming. You can, you can combine some command in the Bash and to, make, to do, do your job more easily. And for the SQL, SQL, it is a kind of a database um, language. So, so I think um, most of you, or I, I think everyone at this stage should be familiar with um, Microsoft Office, for example, this uh, Excel or Access. They are kind of a database, data collection or data storage. You can easily to manipulate your data, but there are some limitations. I think for Excel, um, 2016 version, the maximum raw numbers should be 1 million. So if you, if you have a very huge data and it over the li limit, then you cannot use Excel to handle that. But for SQL, I think the limit is your storage, storage or your RAM storage. So this is some people, they like to keep the data in a SQL server or SQL database. It's easy for now and for the future to play around it. So, all right, thanks uh, about uh, like an information about the programming languages and I also would like to remind all the audience that if you have any questions in the middle of the conversation, you can always uh, raise your hand and uh, we will make sure that we bring you to the stage and you can ask your questions directly to Ching Wen. And if there are no questions at this time point, uh, I would like to proceed to the next uh, step. So. Often, uh, let's say when we talk about bioinformatics and uh, programming, finally what we are actually up to is uh, packages. So I would like to, uh, let's say I would like you, I would like to know from you that what are the packages that frequently bioinformaticians use and uh, we can start off uh, with specific use case scenarios uh, starting with uh, exploratory data analysis and specifically speaking data visualization and that stuff. So this is something that we usually go to informaticians for, right? So what are the type of packages that you usually use for the scenario? Uh, I think the, this question is quite big because it's really depending on what kind of um, study or analyze or yeah, data analysis you are doing now. And so it's, there's no correct answer for that. But I think from my side, because um, especially for data analysis. The end is to sell your data to all to the audience. So from my side, I think have a nice image is always the, the good way, the best way to explain what I try to present. So I personally, I like to using this. Um, so I think program a package is also coming to different program language. For that, they have a different things to do. So from now on, I think I, because I'm more familiar with R at this moment, so I will focus on the R, R language. And I think the most popular is this, um, as I said, how do you generate a graph? So for that, there's a very powerful uh, package from R, it's called ggplot. People using that to generate some quite a lot of amazing um, graphs, you can have bar chart, you can have pie chart if you want. You can also have a kind of a heat map and also some fancy bar chart, um, yeah, fancy box plot, for example, like a violin plot. All these things is doable with the GG plot. So this is a very popular package. And I think if people um, yeah, doing data analysis, you will anyhow touch that. Not only, in, so because it, uh, ggplot is coming from R, but it's very powerful and very useful. Then people generate similar package in the Python language. So if you're using Python language, you can also generate similar plots by this ggplot package in Python. So this is the, the thing um, I use a lot. And like I say, ggplot, you can have a heat map, but sometimes there are some limitation there. So if you want to using, if you want to um, explain your data in a matrix format, the heat map is a useful tool. 
Then for heat map, um, from my side, uh, from my understanding, there's a very good um, package. It's called complex heat map. So using in general, you will so um, in general when you have a heat map, it's always um, single heat map in a single graph or a single panel. But with this um, complex heat map, those uh, make it very easy to combine more than one heat maps in a single graph. So then you can extend your findings, you can add more values or more annotations to your data. So I would say these two are the major things. But like I say, it's really depending on what you were doing and what you want to show. So for example, a few days ago, we have a meeting in a, this, um, this COVID-19 um, meeting. And one, one PI, he mentioned that when we have this dendrogram, histogram, yeah, yeah, dendrogram, sorry. Then we try to f um, flip the leaves to make it more visualized. And at the moment, I don't know there's a package they can reach. They, they, it call is um, optimize leaf ordering. I don't know this kind of tool, so I just do that manually. But then one PI call mentioned, okay, this, this kind of tool, it, it helps you to reach, to easily reach the most satisfied distance between every leaf in this dendrogram. So, and then I looking for the package and I learn how to use it. So I would not say there's some essential or necessary packages for biologists. Everything is possible. You just check, looking for the information you need when you need it, and that's all. Thank you. So let's say, okay, now I have decided that I will learn R and Python. And for my figures, then I would use ggplot. Okay. So one of the, uh, let's say, questions that I see around in the internet, and there are like always a lot of workshops, and even our organization named as uh, NGS service based on, let's say, NGS technologies. Uh, we wanted to sound uh, similar to them, and we always get emails asking us, when are you having a workshop to, uh, let's say, analyze NGS data? So it's like a buzzword. So let's say if I also want to analyze uh, next generation sequencing data uh, to be specific for an RNA sector pipeline or something. So what are the tools that you would usually use for this? Uh, and can I do all this within R? Um, for sure, if you want to do that all in R, it's doable, but sometimes it's very challenging because they are quite a lot. So maybe you know, in, at this moment, there are um, commercial packages, commercial softwares, and uh, open source softwares, so which are generated by different authors. So they will not, especially for the open source, they will not cover all the functions. So in, if you're using this, um, if you're doing this data analysis, and you are using um, this open source, then you need to just combine everything, everything uh, one by one. So by then, it's, it will be challenged to using R to, to do this analysis. So I think um, using this um, command line or terminal model to, do, to using this tool is more easy to uh, learn just pure R language. So for next generation sequencing, I think from my side, um, most people are starting from to know the differential expression, uh, gene differential expression. So for that, it's, you will always have uh, transcriptome data. You can either generate yourself or you can download that from public database, for example, the GEO on NCBI. And they collect uh, numerous data sets. So like these days, um, I'm trying to present, prepare is how to analyze this chip seek data. And I want to have uh, some kind of a small tutorial for myself. So I'm looking for some data there. And then you, you have some kind of a standard protocol, but I, I don't know, I, I need to explain that at this moment. But I can. No, no, no. We, we don't have to get into the, let's say, the protocol side of things. But I'm just uh, on an overview of the tools that you would use for them. Would you name? Can you name some? Yeah, of course. So, like I say, you have a raw data you can download from somewhere else. Then, like you do experiment, you always need to quality check does this data good or bad, right? So, for that, um, you, we can do is. For this um, sequencing data, we always use one is called FastQC. 
to do a quality check. And then you can, you may need it uh, to like trim this wreath. Uh, as you know, this sequencing is always um, the, the nucleotide wreath. So we need to remove or eliminate some adapter sequencing or the bad quality wreaths from the sequence, uh, from the, yeah, from the wreaths. So for that, there are a few packages. The one I like the most is um, Chimomatic. That one, you can, you, can, you just need to provide your adapter sequence and then you can run the sequencing and it would, according to your parameters, it will select and give you the best outputs. And then you, you get your, your, like, uh, your, well, your high quality reads. And you, what you need is to doing what you want. For example, to align your reads to back to a reference then you are able to know um, your gene, ex uh, gene expression level. And so that is in some alignment tool, for example, Bowtie 2 or this BWA, both are very popular. They, are, they already been generated, I think, more than 20 years. So these kinds of tools is kind of a standard protocol for people using this next generation sequencing data to analyze, to answer their questions. Thank you. So uh, probably a couple of fields that we would like to also know about, but uh, let's uh, give a chance for the audience to ask if they need to know specifically uh, in the pipeline if they want to learn. So, but uh, let's say uh, we always come to you by informaticians asking specific questions and uh, asking, us, asking you to do specific uh, type of analysis. And it's also not possible that you know everything. So how do you uh, quickly learn and uh, what are the places that you go to to learn the things that we ask you to do uh, whenever you are stuck? Uh, what are the best to learn and troubleshoot when we are learning something new in mathematics? I think in, the, in these days, I just like you, everyone here, if when you have some questions, I think using Google, this um, search engine to looking for the answer, that's what I'm always doing. And when you're doing that, you will find there's um uh, there's a website. I think it's called Slack. Um, Slack something because they have you different. Or, so you, one is also called uh, as, yeah Slack. So they have unlimited. No, I cannot say unlimited, but they have different fields by bio Slack or bio Slack. I think you can find all the answers. Well, no, you cannot find all the answers, but you may find the answers you you want from there. So like I said, I just uh, using Google and looking for the most e the most easier resource you can reach and you can understand it. it may, sometimes you will find that they, uh, um, some website, they see, it seems like it explains a lot, but it's not easy to understand. So just, uh, just looking for the resource you can reach and that's all. Okay. So basically, you're suggesting uh, just Googling around then Stack Overflow. And right. so uh, most of us, when we think about programming, we are always thinking like uh, command line, you know, typing uh, something like, uh, just like we type in commands and uh, results come out, like not so user friendly. But recently, uh, people have uh, been uh, using Jupyter Labs and now Markdown. Can you briefly touch upon the use of notebooks uh, to do the programming and how it's beneficial for someone starting new to start implementing notebooks in their projects. So I think like a, the notebook, the name, notebook is like a, you can easily to put some comments to your program because I think like if when you're doing experiment in lab, you always write a notebook and you, you make a record of what, it, what you did and what you get. So the notebook can easily to reach that. And I, I think here has, has a few limitation for Jupyter things. It's uh, you can using for sure for uh, using Python pro, uh, Python program language. But if you are using something else, then you may need an extra effort to reach it. For example, the, by default, you cannot run R in a Jupyter Jupyter notebook, uh, notebook, but now you can. So anyhow, these things is um you, you can easily just put one or two or a few um comments um comment lines there, and you can process, then you will see what you get from this notebooks uh, lay framework. I think it's very useful. You can easily check uh, your from your input to your output and make sure everything is follow 
follow some order or follow as, uh, as you wish and there's no let's say no bug or no no errors there this is the, the most advantage from us i think this notebook framework is really useful you may using Jupyter notebook but if you let's say if you're using our program language you can using a markdown language that is another kind of um, notebook so for that is um I think that one popular things from uh, our studio uh, for our language the program is called r studio you can use it for free so they support this uh, markdown um, framework that is also very useful to make a record of your code and your record your report so i think that is also two things people can if you're interested you can check it yeah, I also, when I started with uh, programming, uh, I found it incredibly useful to use uh, like R Markdown because rather than uh, having uh, several sentences of code, you could just have a few sentences of code uh, as a block and then you can run only this block separately and have an output and then do block by block. So which found it to be very user friendly to start with coding. and. So another uh, most important question uh, is uh, when we think about bioinformatics and when we think of learning and doing this analysis, all of a sudden, uh, like I in myself including, we feel that uh, uh, we need a lot of uh, computer power. You know, like our computers, our hardware is not good enough. So what would you recommend as a, let's say, the right operating system or a right set of system that you could start using uh, for your bioinformatic pipelines? I think for hardware, you don't really need a very good thing. Or I should say the other way. At this moment, most personal computer, they can afford general, general stuff, general analysis. If you, you are not going to analyze a multiple genome size, genome size data set. So personal PC is, is enough at this moment. But for sure, like I say, if you have a very huge data set, you have a I don't know, for, just for example, for the, ma uh, for the maize and some, some gi giant genome species, then you may need some extra um, hardware, hardware with higher capacity. But that is, everything is fine, um, unless you really need it. So I would say don't worry about hardware. And for the software, oh, I think people are using these days more, more frequently about when they're doing data analysis. Um, Linux is the most popular things. For sure, some people are using Windows, but because they are different, different systems, so you may, especially, the, I think this is the main point. For most package or most software, when they generate for the data analysis, they rely or they focus is on the Linux uh, Linux system. So if you you starting from Windows, uh, Windows 10, 11, something else, it's some you have a lot of limitation. There's quite a lot of tools you cannot use it. So if if you really want to join that, I would suggest is um, starting from Linux. And when you check the Linux on Google, you will find there are numerous pack, um, I don't know if it's called package or not. All distributions. So there are quite a lot of things. So for that, you just choose the the one most popular and most well maintained. I think this is the the main major things you can select. And if you're using Macintosh computer, you are kind of lucky because it is based on the Unix-like system. So you can use in most um, Linux package on the Macintosh computer. But I only say most because for sure there are still some limitation there. But it's a little bit easier than Windows computer to run this data analysis. Okay, so at this moment, I would like to take a small uh, a pause and ask audience if you have any questions uh, at this time point, feel free to raise your hands and you can directly ask them to Chung Wen. Otherwise, we can just uh, resume our interview. So, so looks like uh, no question. So maybe we are asking the right questions, uh, which might be in their minds. So I also wanted to briefly touch upon uh, three uh, different names that I've heard about uh, when we think about bioinformatics. Uh, 
uh, this is also with the uh, relationship with the previous expria uh, like question about the hardware equipment starting with the uh, galaxy platform galaxy platform for uh, bioinformatics so what do you think about it and uh, what can we do in that platform so i heard galaxy system is doing my phd uh, yeah could you hear me yeah yeah we can hear you okay okay good so uh, as i say I, i heard galaxy system is doing my phd and at the moment is um one of a senior postdoc at the moment he is he also try to join um the field to analyze this some ngs data and because he's not familiar with this command line so and then he find okay this this um galaxy system you can what do you need you just select, using some um web tool you just select the parameters on the on the page and you upload your data and then you will you you can get a result from this this server so at the moment i feel it's quite convenient for people just to try and to really of course you can also and really analyze your data but the disadvantage from my side is i think um when you have most case the ngs data is quite huge so when you you, you need upload that for example uh, these days i just download as i say for the chip stack chip stack um tutorial for myself one file is um 2 gigabytes so and then i download two two is a uh, two gigabyte two two gigabytes file and the other two is is smaller but it's still a few megabytes so if i need to upload download upload download these things uh, quite frequently using galaxy server is not that um convenient for myself so i i, I didn't use it a lot so i just know a little bit about it okay so second um, uh, which we discussed in the lab and could also be something uh, powerful is google collab right would you like to yes. introduce this to our uh, uh, audience i think um google collab is um it's many so, sorry i think we can hear you so the um so, sorry for this um connection i think it's some, sometimes it's a little bit loose and is everything fine now yeah yeah we are able to hear you hello sorry yeah yeah can hear you okay sorry i think some, sometimes there's some um, interruption here Okay, just let me know if you if you lost my voice. Okay. Yeah. So sure. for Google Colab, I as I say, it's mainly based on it's mainly established by Python, actually the Jupyter notebook. So if you using this Google Colab, you can using um you need it with Python and then you can your know, analysis there. So this is um something uh you can. You don't have. If you don't know how to install Python or how to install Jupyter on computer, then you can try um, Colab. I think it's a very good. Um, you can have experience how to play around using the um, Python for for uh, Python and Jupyter for data analysis. And you can also so I I don't think it's set up. So you can use also using R as a kernel in a Jupyter notebook. You can um, upload your file. understand about collab at this moment okay the other very good um thing about collab is you can easily find some shared pay, uh, some shared jobs that i should i can call it from um, shared in collab so you can just you don't even need to download you just need to open the link then and google will automatically 
link, right? Uh, open, open the link with Colab. That, so then you can easily follow um, the notebook because it's a Jupyter notebook. So you can follow um, the instruction um, either from the text or from the comment. Then you can understand um, what they're doing and what kind of results you will be generated by the code. So there's some some of the advantage and something I like about Colab. And uh, with the, my, uh, let's say, limited interaction with Colab, what I found cool is that uh, literally you don't have to even set up anything. You just log into your Google account and your Google Drive data you can directly use and you can copy paste from others' notebooks and you already have your project set up and uh, and it's very easy to share and also get others' pipelines directly. It's literally, you can start programming without any limitations. And Google also has a fantastic tutorial uh, regarding machine learning and uh, exploratory data uh, in, within the Colab. So do check that out. And, yes. and uh, so, let, do you want to add something to me? Oh, no, 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 let's go on. Yeah, so uh, the next thing, how, uh, how can we miss out on GitHub? Why do we use GitHub? Why do I keep hearing this name, GitHub, always? So GitHub is a one um, respiratory, so you can find quite a lot of um, projects there, especially most of them are um, free to download, so they are open source. You can, yeah, you can keep what you're doing, your codes and your results. I think the powerful thing when I first know about GitHub is it can provide some um, version control. So I think at this moment, if you are, for example, if you are writing some um, manuscripts, you may are using Microsoft Word. So when you finish, let's say in this January, you finish one version, so you will name it version one. And by um, February, you may modify something and you name it version two. And go on and on, you may have version, for example, we have a version 31 for the COVID-19 manuscript. Then if you want to trace back what you did, what is, what's the difference between version one and, and previous one? GitHub, they provide this kind of function. You can easily um, present what you modified in the past. So this is a the good thing. And like I say, you can also reach a lot of resources about yeah, almost everything. People share that for free. So I think that's the, the good thing, the powerful thing about GitHub. And one last thing is that recently the publications, they also uh, upload their code if they did a set of analysis in GitHub and you can straight away find uh, the link into the GitHub repository which may even include the data and the analysis uh, pipeline that they did and recently it's becoming a trend that whenever you have a paper with a lot of data analysis, you can upload the code and data together in GitHub because it's of unlimited storage. So that's something that uh, I think we have to learn as well, uh, right? So I think uh, I have covered all the buzzwords that I've heard around in uh, bioinformatics. So let's uh, go towards uh, informal side of being a bioinformatician. So how is your conventional work day like? Because uh, we wet lab people, we are just running around the lab doing mini preps most of the time and PCS. So how is your conventional work day like? <laughs> I think so. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So like, I think in the beginning I say I'm um come from Taiwan and now I'm in. So this they come, and I'm I'm still working here. So this the convenient things from my from my side is I can basically work from everywhere, and anytime. So that's the yeah the convenient one. One, and also the disadvantage things because for that it means people can ask me um, anytime to have their, to have some results because they will, um, I can do it anytime anywhere but anyhow I, I like um, I can I can just bring my laptop and sitting somewhere else and start doing analysis that's the most convenient things and the thing I enjoy a lot Right. Uh, do you spend most of your time uh, just copy pasting your file and arranging files uh, because files are your raw data and also output? I I I would not say I spend a lot of time copy and paste, but 
but I spend a lot of time checking my code and checking the, the data I generate, is that correct or not? I think that's the most, the most, uh, most time I spend on. So one of the apparent change that I observed uh, when I tried to do what you tried to do, what you're doing, is that uh, to sit in the same place for the whole day. So this is not something usual for people who are doing experiments in the lab. And I also found it to be extremely painful and uh, discomforting, let's say. So how do you manage uh, to do this? And uh, I see that most of the information people are just sitting in the desk for most of the time. I. I think people sitting most of the time in front of the computer, but they will not focus on the same thing for whole day. So we just switch our focus. For example, uh, we do coding, and that's a few times. Then we are looking for some answers, and just um, the other time maybe reading some paper. So we uh, switch our focus to kind of uh, relax ourselves. I think that if you want to try, this is the the easier way or yeah, the way to to get used to computer for the whole day. All right. So uh, having transitioned uh, uh, into like a complete bioinformatician, and having done both uh, like lab experiments as well as uh, now doing stuff in the computer, do you ever start missing doing real, real experiments in the lab? <laughs> Sometimes I was thinking it would be good if I can, um, let's say, put my hand dirty on something. But once I started, I think I would not only satisfy with a few, for example, some PCR or some cloning. I think that is not, not that, that is super interesting for me. So if I really starting some um, well lab experiment, I would spend more time than I image on it. So at this moment, I would say I satisfy with my current stage. All right. So uh, thank you. So uh, last set of questions are even more informal. So starting with one, uh, let's say from India, so we give you unlimited time, uh, let's say money, and also you are not limited on the computational power that you can use for your experiment. What kind of research would you like to undertake? Uh, in your future and also in that kind of setup? Well, <laughs> that's a really challenging thing. But um, I think if I really have this kind of unlimited resource, I'm interested in is, um, so from June, uh, June label, from June, we know one gene is um, being regulated, but we don't know the true um, biological phenomena, which means we don't know the true protein um, activity profile. So I, at this moment, I'm still tr thinking and trying to find a way, can I using the transcriptional data to represent the protein level and then can really reflect the biological situation. So I think for that, what, we, what I need is um, the true protein activity. And then I can make a link between gene expression and protein expression. Then I may able to um, present the protein level and then it's easier to explain this um, biological situation. I, I think that's something I would like to try. Okay, so um, lastly, uh, for me, uh, I have also looked at uh, Taiwan as a country which is highly developed, and also I aspire to do my PhD in Taiwan in Academia Sinica. And uh, uh, from an Indian point of view, uh, what set of advantages you get actually moving to Germany, considering we think that Taiwan is already good in research? And uh, what made you to choose uh, Germany? And also, can you contrast between the research uh, environment in Taiwan and Germany? I think in Taiwan, everything is good. But something is not that good is because Taiwan is a small island. So which means the traffic is not easy to reach different country. So, that was set the limitation there. If we want to really reach different things, we need to plan, plan a lot, and then going there. Then by plan to, for example, to Japan, to Korea, Singapore, to Hong Kong, and that's something I I don't like that much. But in Germany, it's more easy. You can reach to Paris, to I don't know, to um, Denmark, to Netherlands, very easily. You don't. You just need to uh, arrive the the 
the train station and then take a train, take a and to the to the airport, take a flight. It's far more easy in in Europe to do these um, kinds. How do I say that? Um, knowledge sharing. I think this is the main dis, uh, main difference here. And the other thing is because Taiwan is small, so it's small, but it's a lot of population. Well, for, at least from my side. So which means they are. How do I say that? They are, I I think something that now they um well organized and which cause um there's not that much research um institute or research company in Taiwan because people are more focusing on small thing on tiny thing but in Europe I think um, from my side I think there are more chance to really doing some um interesting research. So I would say in Germany or in Europe, there are more chance to doing the thing you like than in Taiwan. That's from my side. Okay, so uh, yeah, it's good to know that between the such atmosphere in Taiwan and Germany. So lastly, uh, um, let's say you if you haven't met me. So what is a Taiwanese national's imp impression about India? <laughs> like completely in common. Okay, so um, perhaps you know, um, before I started my PhD, I did uh, two years research assistant in Academia Sinica. So at that moment, some of the PhD students, they are coming from India. So I think from my side, they are quite um, smart um, to doing some, not only doing experiment, but also so some idea, idea sharing, because as a PhD, I think um, they always been asked to discuss with the advisor a lot. So that's something I, from my side, I think people from India are quite smart compared to different countries because at the moment I also touch with a different PhD students. So this is something I, yeah, in my, I, I, as, I, as, I, as I know, as I, uh, I heard about people from India. And the other interesting thing I heard is um, in, in the USA, they, people say if a uh, Taiwanese, they say their math are the second, and then who will be the first is the people from India. So it means, um, well, in Taiwan, people always say um, Indian people is very good in math. So we should try to learn something from them. I would say that. Okay, interesting and uh, good to know that. And lastly, what is one thing that you want all Indians to know about Taiwan? Uh, what, what, what is the one thing I think people would like uh, Indian to know about Taiwan? Um, yeah. I, I, think, I, I think you know quite a lot. But I would say, I don't know. I don't have a, a very special opinion about that. But I think you can, you can reach, you can, let's say, you can visit Taiwan freely to every place. Because Taiwan is, um, is different, from, maybe different from what you heard from the news and about China and Taiwan. Because I think many people, they just always confuse about Taiwan and China. And as I heard, um, some people are afraid to visit China because there are some freedom limitation. But these things is not uh, true in Taiwan. So you can easily, you can do everything you like in Taiwan. All right. Thank you, Chung Wen. So this uh, last, uh, let's say, this was the last two things from my side. So my final call to audience. So do you have any question in your mind that was not answered during this uh, session? Uh, the, which you would like to directly ask to Chung Wen. Uh, yes, Gopal, go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you for sharing your experience. It was really informative. Uh, the one thing I want to know is, since you are an individual who transitioned from a wet lab to a dry lab, uh, I just want to know that, that uh, while you were transitioning, you were uh, you had to accumulate a lot of skills and at times we tend to overlook some of the skills we try to accumulate. Was there any kind of skill that uh, you wish you had learned be, uh, before you transitioned or while you were transitioning? 
Um, I would say um, if you have a more strong background about statistics, it will be good. You know, helpful for um, some in silico data analysis because that is most of them are based on mass calculation, right? So if you have you are you have some knowledge about statistics, I think it will be good. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I guess so. So, are there any other questions from the audience? I don't see anyone raising hand. So, um, thanks a lot, Jingwen. It was a pleasure having you here with us. And on behalf of NGSF, I wish you best of luck in your research career and personal life. Uh, so that's it, folks. Thanks for being a wonderful audience. We will catch you all in the next event. Until then, it's bye from Ron, Ram, and have a great week ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your invitation.